Today, I'd like to invite um, our first speaker now, Zasha Kolan, who has been busy um, working as an art writer and curator, who, who has worked on a range of collective projects. We met around a decade ago, Zasha, and it feels like your work has been tremendous and unceasing. And also at the same time, really working in several informal ways. You've challenged the institutional structures. You've, you've, you've taken your distance. You've produced informal alliances. And I feel, you know, beyond the official biography that that is a strength. Uh, Zasha's focus has been around contemporary art in Indo-Burma since the 1980s. She continues to write extensively her recent uh, essays include Interlaced Journeys, Diaspora, and the, and the Contemporary in Southeast Asian Art, and in Art and Ecology, um, edited uh, for Mark with uh, Ravi Agarwal and Latika Gupta. She has co-founded the Black Rice uh, Collective in Tusang, Nagaland, uh, and has worked as curator of modern Indian art at CSMVS Museum from 2009 to 11 before co-founding the Curatorial Collaborative and Union of Artists that we all know very well, Clark House Initiative, collaborative projects realized with Sumesh Sharma from 2010 to 15. I'm not going to go through a lot of different projects that are listed, but importantly, today we will hear about the third Pune Biennale, and also perhaps at least in questions bring up the work that Zasha did with Marco Scottini as part of the second Yinchuan Biennale in 2018. Currently, she is teaching comparative curatorial theory in Milan and is co-curating a year-long project that is a public art commission at the National Public Library in Oslo. Welcome, Zasha. Thank you so much. Um, um, it's it's so wonderful to be at the hub after so many years. Thank you so much for such a special invitation. It's so uh, special to have Natasha weave in, um, and thank you for the introduction, but also to weave in all the speakers and all the thoughts that are uh, being presented into a kind of conversation and dialogue. And I think what I loved most about when I was at the hub with Sumesh uh, so many years ago was um, was this element of the audience and how uh, interactive it was and um, I, th I think along with Pratik and Priyanka and their team they are able to through everything really create this warm space for dialogue and that's really been um, not just in the hub, but uh, especially in the hub, you, you feel felt, one felt that warmth very much. And thank you so much for how active you've been this year, despite everything, and in this hub itself, uh, in spite of the immense um, void you must feel. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. So maybe I start just with um, some early thoughts uh, that I had while, while trying to put this presentation together, which were um, how, what this journey has been over these many projects. And I guess it's, uh, it's been one of, of changing positions in a way, I mean, I began really interested in the idea of the community, the idea of the minority as a way to speak against certain kinds of um, uh, state violence uh, that was very, very present to me. And I think I was even probably in a paranoid curatorial way, <laughs> kind of in intrigued by how we could speak to that. And, uh, I think through these last projects, and this is why I think exhibitions are very interesting because they, they really are 
ways in which uh, we change by the end of the exhibition. It's not what we thought we were setting out to do. And it's really a form of knowledge production in that sense. And I think that's what interests me a lot about curating in general, that, um, that, that the project changes and changes us. And hopefully uh, we, we have this sense of a dialogue. Uh, so what I think what, uh, what changed was really to let go of, through these projects that you mentioned, Natasha, to, to let go of this idea of community and minority. Um, that that wasn't the best way to maybe think about uh, terrain and being situated. Um, and so I think the, la the projects I'm talking about have to do with, um, you know, if disruption as Nah Namana who just presentation, you know, made very clear that he always disrupt or in that particular work disrupted each room or each narrative. Uh, that's been particularly important to my own work as well. And I always try to disrupt what I'm doing, but um, I think uh, also, uh, disrupting the very idea of the minority and the idea of the community is, is maybe the arc that links um, some of these projects that I'm going to present today. I have a lovely winter sun that I'm going to try and get out of it. Uh, okay. So uh, the third Puna Biennale was, uh, it was a very special invitation. and reminded of the last time I spoke about, uh, you know, in a curatorial hub, and it was uh, something called the, a symposium on the irrational Biennale. And uh, Gerardo Mosquera, I remember, was talking about um, the poor Biennale, you know, how somebody in the newspapers had called this Biennale the poor Biennale. And he actually took that um, term in a very positive, as a positive, it wasn't meant that way. Um, and I think uh, we had this similar feeling for, for the Puna Biennale that it was with a very tiny budget and also no really, no institutional spaces were really, um, or there was no uh, predefined space for the exhibition. Uh, I curated it with Luca Cerizza and both of us, I, I guess, had uh, this feeling that art did not have to um, that, that maybe it didn't have to change uh, spaces so much and th there was no need for a kind of um, spectacularization or even theatricalization uh, sometimes. And uh, I think what was uh, interesting to us was to try to inhabit or uh, the, the space of the city Puna itself, which is quite a, a challenge. Um, and it was also a, a lot of fun to try to do that and not uh, use any really um, typical art spaces. So we titled it, titled it Habit Cohabit. And it was a word play on having to break your habits in order to cohabit or in order to, um, you know, break one's rituals, traditions, uh, to really live with another or an other. And Puna, it seemed to us, you know, was really um, facing a lot of migration. Um, when we made this project in 2016 and it opened in the early days of 2017, it seemed that Puna was really, uh, it was an internal migration from all parts of India, especially Maharashtra. So kind of um, migration of students, workers, um, it had become, it wanted to be a new smart city. And uh, we chose, so un unlike other biennales in India, like Kochi, uh, which is somehow in a, a, I wouldn't call it an urban setting. I wouldn't call it a, the kind of space that, that Pune is. For us, it was very important to embrace this uh, urbanity of Pune and not choose very secluded spaces, but we happened to choose one road that went kind of along the river 
but uh, there was the most, um, let's say, a road full of traffic, but we also chose this one line that you see, so in the image on the right, or here it's better perhaps. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's this one monster road, very dense, uh, concrete um, uh, sprawl, but there's also an archaeological site, the Pataleshwar Caves that goes back to the eighth century. Um, and it's, it happens to be one of the, you know, fastest uh, growing cities in, in Asia. So we went, we had given a kind of suggestion even of a, of a route and of timings of these different spaces, primarily because um, we titled it Habit Go Habit, um, also thinking of uh, this, these last lectures by Roland Barth called How to Live Together. And the subtitle of our exhibition was um, Artist, Artistic Simulations of Some Everyday Spaces. So we chose spaces really in the public fabric, uh, spaces that were a school, an underpass, uh, um, a temple, um, a park, a bridge, um, one museum, but not a, an art museum, kind of industrial uh, museum, a printing press that happened to be where uh, the bus tickets, but even the voter electoral cards were being printed. So uh, different spaces that were um, working around the clock. And so one of the reasons for the timings was because some places uh, couldn't be disturbed, like the school uh, couldn't have for security reasons for the students, I couldn't have a general public entering during school hours. So that was one of the reasons we had to time, I mean, or suggest timings. Um, we loved this um, museum. It even had a sign called museum, <laughs> which we thought was um, exactly how we were thinking of each space, also symbolically what it stood for and the actuality of that space. Um, this museum was rather incredible because it had, um, it was mainly an ex uh, exhibition that had become a museum. So it had an exhibition related to industry, engineering, geology, um, but also natural history. And uh, these were some of the ways in which, you know, we wanted to cohabit also with co other cultural references. Uh, one of the artists was Yona Friedman. Um, and he had made this Museum of Simple Technology in Madras um, in India in 1982. He'd also made these manuals for India for um, this idea that, uh, of self-reliant um, housing. And they were just cartoons. They had no words, so they were meant to uh, cross languages. And uh, so this doesn't exist anymore, these, um, this Museum of Simple Technology in Madras. But we had the manuals with us and uh, Yona was in touch with five different universities. So one interesting thing about the Pune Biennale is it's a, a meeting of um, the city and the, the government with, um, with a, a Bharti Vidya Peet University of Architecture, College of Architecture. So, they invite, we invited five different universities to participate and each one came up with a different kind of uh, project based on those manuals. And um, this was the one that happened in the museum. So it was called, he titled it self-help housing, but it was also interesting to put this kind of interaction with the colleges and the uh, students, um, uh, at the forefront of, of our way of working because Una is, and especially at that time, um, the colleges were going through immense turmoil. Maybe they still are, but it was really a moment when they were um, 
there was a lot of protests happening around the management of the college and it, the college itself became something really to embrace and something to um, in, involve in a, in a dialogue. So, so the, this project was interesting also because of that kind of um, way in which uh, it involved so many so many different universities. And this was another, uh, ver what another group had come up with in, in the park. And uh, we used, you know, this pavilion in the museum as a kind of the place for the opening where we had all the talks and lectures. And um, I found these images of Tushar Jog, and I'm sure a lot of us uh, who miss him very much um, would love to see him. Uh, like this again. So he was, uh, you see Shubigi Rao, Marcello Maloberti, um, Ishwar from Uramili, um, all, and, and Luca Cerica at the right, um, have it, in one of the few artist talks we, we did all together. Uh, it's really nice to see Tushar again, and I will talk about his work. Uh, later, and later on, this um, uh, this pavilion became a place for students to study because, in fact, the museum had given its second floor over to um, as a kind of study center for um, the colleges in the area, which was also interesting. So, this became a place for for people to eat or have a coffee and then go back up and and work. Um, so as you enter the museum, you may or may not have encountered a, a performance that we thought was very uh, uh, in special, which was just that um, one of the people, maybe the person at the reception would, um, or, or one of the guards uh, would have a, would, would show you something, maybe take you into a corner and show you something. And that was the, um, uh, it's called Double Shell by Massimo Bartolini. And uh, it was this idea that the, the shell is somehow enclosing uh, the grain of sand. It was a, a pearl that had been carved out. So it was just the shell of uh, pearl left and that it had been enclosing this um, grain of sand and uh, this was enclosed in the hand of the museum guard in turn enclosed as the artworks would be in a in a museum so it was a kind of self-referential uh, way and he he would show show this uh, to people and and uh, um, not everybody, of course, but whoever he met through the course of the Biennale, which lasted one month it, for financial reasons. Um, as you entered, there was Amol Patu. Uh, he was working with this uh, image, at, uh, as you enter the museum, of a skin of a crocodile killed in 1870, just to give you an idea of the kind of works in the museum. And uh, Amul had made uh, many years ago, I think, um, uh, an, a work called Wilt, where uh, he lost a skin, basically. He takes it off. Um, and this, this made, made sense in relation. And he kind of played with the whole ground floor of the museum. Uh, here he had a tiny video image uh, again where he wills like like a snake he re removes a skin um, he's here he was playing with some images of reptiles snakes in in the vitrines um, he's made a series of dust objects and he was uh, placing these within different uh, vitrines, uh, different uh, cases and cabinets. So this was a section called China where, where he inserted things he finds uh, in, in debris, in, in rubbish heaps and collects dust and covers them in dust. 
of this is another one from wood carving. So along with, and I mean, the, for a more, so this was actually um, magnetic filings that were, um, that were constantly in motion kind of kinetically. And Amol uh, always talks about the, the chol where he where he grew up and the sense of um, the sense of movement, the sense of humor that he has really seems to come from uh, from there. He's actually a, a performance artist and has a long um, line of um, a very interesting grandfather who who left uh, these kind of spoken word poems about Ambedkar that he found later in cupboards. Uh, his own father um, would go around with a dictaphone collecting the sounds and the accents and the stories of migrant workers in the mills. And um, Amor transforms and translates all of this into his, his own uh, performative practice, but also very sophisticated uh, visual practice. So this was all these uh, glass bottles and jars were also found in rubbish heaps, discarded, and uh, he's etched um, onto them in this this kind of room where there were a lot of cases behind uh, red curtains of, of glass objects. He etched all these figures of the, the city, people who were um, I, workers on scaffolding or um, just images of work. Um, or really, you know, so one of the things uh, Bath uh, talked about was um, that, that was really important for our exhibition was this, um, this idea of idiorhythmy. And um, and that you know how we cohabit uh, is so much dependent on us being allowing uh, different rhythms in the city, kind of uh, your own particular rhythm. And to discuss uh, power, he says that the subtlety of power as dysrhythmy, as heterorhythmy. So neither solitude or hermeticism, nor excessively assimilate forms like the monastery, family, boarding school, barracks, any kind of established militarized time or homogenizing time. Um, and removing it from any religious context, Bath thinks of idiorhythmy as an attempt to reconcile collective life with individual life. And most of his lectures describe this kinds of collective solitude. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to present um, this, this work from 2017 now, because uh, something about this, um, this idea of collective individual time, uh, individual solitude uh, reminded me of, of our present moment and uh, the productivity of that, the kind of potential radicality of that, which is what we were looking at in this exhibition that within a roaring urban uh, South Asian city, how, um, how, can, how can we not uh, subject to, to either heterogeneous time or homogenizing time or most of all militarized ideas of time. Um, and it's interesting that he doesn't think of the monastery or the larger communities. Um, you know, for him, it was the smaller communities. And if you think of Pune and its Osho ashram and, and, and the, this idea of experimenting with community formation has been something that uh, is somehow also a legacy of the city. Uh, and so all the works, I think, were thinking about this or, or translating this in, in different ways, working with this idea of time. Um, so 
Uramili's uh, spent their uh, collective project uh, that started in 2007, I think, and they have been collecting the sounds of labor, uh, especially disappearing labor all across India. Uh, it's a very intriguing archive that they're building. And this is, um, uh, we invited them to, to spend a month in residence uh, and they worked along the river and made a 40 minute film uh, with everything from a, some, a pigeon trainer or somebody who'd feed pigeons, uh, a teacher teaching English, teaching letter writing. Um, uh, a woman selling sunglasses, different forms of economy, but also different birds along the debris of the river, different kinds of animal life. It's in, uh, this is a work by in the Infinite Library, um, which is two artists um, working together, uh, Daniel Gustav Kramer and uh, Iris Epiminanda. And they've been doing this uh, for a while, um, inserting, um, sorry, maybe two publications into one, um, making them cohabit somehow, uh, joining two different uh, kinds of publications and to form a new book and they would rebind it as a new book. And hence this, these infinite juxtapositions that are quite intriguing. This was Sanket Jadia, um, kind of referencing, you've seen these posters, the way in which this didactic uh, form of display was, was in the museum and some of the industrial. So here he shows the process for making the object, you know, all, all, the, uh, all the parts around the making of the object. So in a very technical way. And Shubigi Rao, um, who is now curating the next Kochi Biennale, uh, you know, we, we invited her to, uh, at the time, to, to look at, because she has this fabulous uh, imagine, imaginary of, again, debris. And she spent, uh, I think, three weeks in this museum and, and in other spaces collecting uh, stories of the museum from all that it was throwing away, all that, it, that was in the storage, all that was literally, um, being discarded. And she came up with incredibly funny uh, stories, uh, very much working with the kind of exhibits that were in the museum, but also uh, uh, narrating them fine, and, and adding her own drawings. Uh, very, again, hilarious poems that she was draw writing. Um, we were very intrigued by a young artist called Smita Rajmane, who was making these paintings of Pune as a city. Uh, from this aerial perspective, but also a kind of um, isometric uh, perspective. And where you see um, kind of the cinema, the brothel, the red light area, different kinds of um, imagery of, of the city. And here I want to um, talk about, you know, what, what a Biennale uh, allows is, of course, this um, wonderful uh, conversation with the government. So we were given uh, many hoardings along the uh, Jangli Maharaj Road. And we were uh, um, asked to use them for an art project. And we, uh, we invited Rupali Patil um, to, to make a work and she decided to show a line of washing. Uh, she was interested in this kind of act, very uh, mod modest act of censorship, self-censorship uh, by, you know, over um, the underclothes, placing a, a, you know, a garment special only for women's underclothes, of course, and always uh, these acts of uh, 
daily life and, and washing. And she wanted to place this on a hoarding uh, as a way to start a conversation, I guess, about um, uh, the, maybe the, yes, this, this idea of self-censorship. And what happened is that, uh, and modesty and uh, women as opposed to um, how, how other kinds of washing are, are hung. And uh, it, was, it was censored, we didn't expect that. Uh, but censored in the sense it was it was not allowed. So she kept coming up with new proposals of how you know she she would uh, still wanted to go on a billboard, but you know with different kinds of censors, and each one was rejected. Uh, you see, she has tried different ways of camouflaging the initial uh, image, and uh, e each one was rejected. And finally, we. Uh, and this is a kind of credit to the organizers, uh, uh, Kiran Shinde and the team that, you know, they said, no, let, let it go in the catalog, let it go in, it can go in the museum as an image, but we won't put it on the hoarding. And uh, so that's what we did. And instead of putting just the image, we put all the project proposals. So the title became Project Proposals for Museum Hoarding. And um, I think that uh, the, the, and we didn't use the hoardings for anything else. We left them blank. I think we left the captions. Uh, and I think what, what was interesting is this work did get covered in the press. It got spoken about quite a lot, uh, which is which is not lovely. And I think what what what's really interesting about facing censorship is that it is a bit disarming. It is a bit, uh, somehow it does throw us because we, I guess, either artists or curators don't expect that. And you don't know, um, you don't, you can't predict what will be more sensitive. And I guess uh, what was, what was interesting for me each time that, you know, and, and it's happened again in, in almost, in, in Yin Chuan Biennale for sure. Uh, I guess it's a moment actually of exposure. It's a moment where you realize where the invisible line is. And in that sense, it's also a moment of play because as a curator, you, and this is where I'm thinking of Naomi Beckwith's um, idea of the curatorial excess or Anna Nahuja talking about, you know, the disturbance, um, I think, this is this is in part, you know, what, what's so interesting about the Biennale format that you are in somehow in conversation with the government as well. And uh, it's this is the form it, it takes, you know, a kind of exposure of where the lines. And it's not really any conversation with ideology. I think it's a conversation with governmentality. So the interpretation of an ideology. So. I think um, we had, again, uh, a, lot, a lot of the places we were meant to have at the last minute were, um, were blocked or we couldn't have them. So we had to enter into a study room of the museum and uh, we decided to make, uh, Thomas Saraceno made a work kind of for that uh, study center with this idea of uh, um, cosmic jive. It was uh, everything about spiders from how they relate to cosmology, to um, cohabitation, the only 16 species of spiders that cohabit with other species, the otherwise solid, solitary spiders. Uh, that cohabit with other spiders. So um, there were all kinds of scientific papers and it's an ongoing archive that's been uh, made. We, we had all these papers and, and several copies of them. And the idea was that you could post it to a friend or to yourself. You could make a selection and, of a book and, and post it. And so um, it's also, 
what was interesting for us was to, if these are artistic simulations of everyday spaces, also of everyday activities, like and everyday infrastructures of the post. So every morning we would have uh, the post posted um, by um, by the the Maharashtra government for us. Um, this is. Uh, since the road was so important, you know, where you crossed also became uh, somehow important. Um, Marinella Senatore made these, these uh, ways in which you could speak uh, your, your politics um, and they were being driven up and down this road and anyone could, anyone could get on and uh, it could become a kind of platform. Uh, and this was the, um, it's the printing office where actually just, uh, just prior to opening where all the voter ballots, et cetera, had been printed, but where bus tickets, all kinds of electricity bills and different, uh, things are, are printed and we use this paper to make a number of artist books. One was by Daniel Gustav Kramer. Um, this was again, and what uh, Shilpa Gupta's work um, about the borders, you know, th again, these were symbolic spaces to us as well. So they, it was a way to uh, talk about the nation by entering this space of democracy or where, where it happens, where the, where the actual ballot is printed, uh, the water cards are printed. This was the Bataleshwar caves from the eighth century where we had um, tried to do some performances. And this is the um, much younger Jangi Maharaj temple right next to it. So there was a kind of uh, time we were trying. What's interesting about this image, for instance, is you see um, you see the the hotel, a new hotel called Silver Splendor, just at the back of this eighth century monument with with several sculptures inside. So it was exactly this kind of juxtaposition we were interested in, and um, this um, idea of of the prasad and the exchange that happens in a temple was uh, something that Nikhil Ronak was uh, working on in his uh, installation. And there was a subway that had been closed for, for a very long time. As soon as it opened, it closed because of an incident that happened there and it never opened again. Uh, so we renovated this um, or we, yeah, we we worked on trying to give it back as an infrastructure. And here was the work of Jimmy Chishi, an artist from um, Nagaland. And he was looking at his own, uh, the warriors, uh, the mythology of the Nagas, but kind of in this underpass, um, kind of as fallen warriors. He also had, was working with a kind of syncretic cohabitation with Japanese masks and Naga tattoos. And uh, it was really a comment, I think, on, on the idea of um, insurgency. And each of these characters is actually a historical figure. And uh, they, they were fallen heroes, I guess. Um, and for him, it was, very significant to use the underpass. It was a kind of a history of, of um, something that if, if all the Naga uh, tattoos, iconography is about the warrior and the hero, it was really, he was undoing this idea. And this is Marinella's, uh, I think she had two of these cycles. And then there was the school, which was... Um, okay, we have two minutes to go. Okay. Uh, 
The school was really where we had a sound work, but also this work by Sanket Jadia on Kashmir. And uh, this work by Sarnath Banerjee, where he took the actual textbooks and was um, drew, drew over them. So it was the history books that they were actually studying at that time. But in this one classroom, they were kind of installed. Each page was um, of the book was drawn on. Um, and I think about, uh, he kind of vandalized the history textbook with the counter history. This was a kind of cohabitation of images. And of course, this image in the park was very important, this uh, parasitical tree growing on another tree. This was again Shubigi Rao from these gutter, concrete gutter uh, frames. Um, she, she was highlighting weeds or framing them. And Mar Massimo Bartolini made a large work called Audience for a Tree. Uh, and the idea was that uh, the spectacle was just that one tree. And it did create within the garden some forms of community, perhaps people used it for privacy, for birthday parties, for along the course of the Biennale. And it still, it remains. And there were also some readings, some talks that happened there. Um, was a way to be with others, but also private and create a separate community. We invited Nathak Company from Pune to uh, write some plays for, for the Biennale and they wrote some uh, fantastic plays that they would perform every day at different times of the day in the park to um, the audience who was already there. This was Shilpa Gupta again with a poem. And I'll just end with Tushar Jog, which he was very interested in how at the Z bridge, and this is a political kind of cultural event. Um, that's how this bridge is often used, but it's also used for teenagers. And um, he invented a game that you could uh, log into. You could get into the Wi-Fi and play Karma Crisis. So you could kind of, um, uh, play a game. It became, I think, the most uh, exciting part of the Biennale for many of the audience members. Um, and this game was taken quite seriously. And it was about allocating the land along the bridge uh, to, to different people, depending on your karma. And uh, I think it came from the fact that he saw everybody hanging out at the bridge, but on their phones. So he realized there was a potential for a kind of uh, LAN community. And this was Marcello Maloberti. That's who made very much out of time. Would love to have a dialogue. Yeah. That's it. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry to brutally cut off. This <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's great to revisit these projects. Um, also, for audiences who weren't able to visit, um, I feel very lucky to have uh, been um, partly a Pune person, having done my, my college years there and knowing very well that part of the city and then discovering how you animated the city with these projects. Um, and particularly what you said now about kind of playing with everyday infrastructures and this role of a museum that has collected dust, but is still somehow central to the city's imaginary, um, what it means to rekindle uh, new sets of relationships and um, micro environments within that kind of museum setup. Um, I'm wondering if you'd like to share perhaps parallels or um, differences in terms of say the work that you have done uh, with Clark House initiative um, and also with Yin Chuan. I mean, with Clark House, it would, I would ask more in terms of the fact that you've maintained long relations with a lot of these artists um, who have been in multiple projects. So it would be quite instructive to perhaps also think together and hear you um, share with us how your 
while your relationship grows with certain artists like Amol or Prabhakar or Rupali, how does the setting of the projects that you invite them into impact that relationship and that frame of making? Um, I, th I think, uh, you know, besides the Clark House, art, Clark House artists, there, there were uh, so many artists who we've had long-term relationships or discussions with. And one of the reasons was because their work was too, too dangerous to them to show sometimes. Like too, it wasn't the right time maybe to show the work that we were seeing sometimes. Um, uh, and so, or we didn't know the right, best vocabulary, so it would be a discussion, it might be a text, it might be a writing, but it would not necessarily be an exhibition, or it would take different forms. Um, and uh, circling, you know, through specific practices I, is, I think, um, I think it, it's, it's nice to also step away at times, and so many of the artists uh, have, you know, have their own trajectories. So when I invite them, it's usually after a break or after a while. It's not a continuous thing, and so there's this new sense of meeting again, you know, in spite of a long dialogue, and actually changing each other again. Um, and uh, so it's one long con continuity in a sense, but it's also this distance from, from each other is also very productive because we get messy with other, um, other influences and then uh, meet again. So that way um, it's a funny sense of being rooted to each other, but also being different to each other's trajectory. And so when I invite them in a different space, it's um, rarely as a commission. It's, you know, it's um, so many of my exhibitions don't have texts or con concept notes even, but, um, but more like a set of objects or a set of archival materials that then go in different um, directions once the artist gets in. And that's why exhibition making is so interesting because um, it produces the knowledge in the making or after the exhibition has opened or even after it's closed. You know, a lot of the knowledge happens then. Would you like to talk briefly about your experience with the Yenshuan Biennale? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a different kind of uh, space. It was, um, I have some images, maybe I can still share. Let me see. Uh, it was a different, I also put some other things on one second. But I just want to give you a sense of it. It was a very different space. It was in a large eco park. And so, it's actually Marco Scottini, the creator of the show. Um, here we are. There was um, many more artists. I think there were over a hundred artists and it was in a large eco park. I was a member of the curatorial team under Marco Scottini. And so many of the works entered this eco park. It was called um, Starting from the Desert, Ecologies on the Edge. And this is where this idea of community really got challenged because I was given a section to work on besides working on, with other artists called on minorities, minorities and multiplicities. But the whole language of ecology changed my way of thinking about that because um, there are no minorities in the language of botany, for example. There's uh, diversity multiplicities. And so this idea that you can contain a minority itself is such a fallacy. And I think that really came home to me with, with the kind of works in this exhibition. So this is um, uh, a work on, um, by Shiva Gore on, on nomadic um, oral culture that he translated, you know, tie, ways of tying knots 
that he translated into um, an installation and how the Banjara would move through a Rajasthan desert or leave a space, leave a camp. And there was also a large museum within this eco park. And so it has very different um, kind of space quality. But in this section on minorities, one thing is, um, you know, that it was kind of similar in the sense that there was a lot of uh, censorship, but strangely not where we expected it. So it was um, to do with any kind of Arabic script. Suddenly all the, I think while we were installing all the signage that usually had three languages, uh, Mandarin, English and Arabic, because there's a large Hui population of Muslim indigenous Chinese there uh, were all suddenly blanked out. And the reason was very um, dubious, you know. And so uh, things like this pottery, which actually doesn't look, it looks decorative, but it, it, ha it has all these hidden uh, words like revolution or, um, it, by by Mortaz uh, and as well, you know, we, we were able to let this remain in the exhibition, but many things that we didn't were not there because they were in Arabic, but for example, might have been part of an image or a carpet or were removed from the from the from the book of the exhibition. Um, this was Look Out for Haigu by uh, uh, it was a way to, to talk about within this eco park and outside. So I guess this was the most everyday it got, otherwise it was not such an everyday um, uh, insertion within any kind of public space. But here you could see um, the Hue community, which was really, you saw that it was at the outskirts and you saw that um, it was a bit marginalized. Um, Asha, there's a question, should we take it? Please. Um, so Rohit Goel is asking if you can talk more about counter monumentality as a concept uh, and your commitment to the archive curated in Pune at the Biennale there. Sure, so, um, so when, when I was, I mean, the slide I ended on in Pune was just a crane lifting up a tree sapling that would then go back to the nursery. But uh, this idea that, uh, the, and this in Pune, it made sense because of the kind of, it, it was a moment when, if you remember the Shivaji sculpture had been uh, maybe vandalized, but it, it created a riot and created, I think two deaths around it or, or more. So, you know, this idea that the monument was not something, and now uh, it's even um, more, real to us how much the idea of the monument still carries some, some weight. And so uh, the idea of the counter monument, I think uh, comes a bit from uh, this wonderful book by Stacey Douglas, where she compares constitutions with, uh, with the museum and thinks that museums are wrong in following the constitution very often, or the way the constitution breaks our societies into minorities, majorities, religious groups, African American, Asian diaspora, whatever. The way that kind of thinking of separating uh, identities and identity politics, you know, that that we play into that uh, far too much. And uh, her idea of counter monumentality, I guess, came from the South African experience uh, and case studies, but it was an idea to, to really instead challenge the constitutional ideas of identity and to try to um, absolutely disrupt any idea of minority community or fixed identity. And that's what museum should be aspiring to, and maybe also our way of looking at monuments. So uh, I think my idea is also very influenced by the artist Milica Tomic and uh, her way of thinking about the 90s in uh, former Yugoslavia and 
um, how, how do you look at even a, a monuments for a genocide camp, you know, uh, this kind of counter monumentality then comes in? I mean, do we, do we look at, so there was a human rights project, a very noble one perhaps to find the remains of people in mass graves and to rebury them in, uh, according to their religion and in their religious rights. But she, as part of the monument group, you know, has been contesting this and saying, but why do we think that their fixed identity is to be Muslim or to be, you know, um, aren't, we, aren't we then um, repeating that same segregating ethnic violence on people by reaffirming ident their whole identity and as just that one thing, a religious identity, when we don't know whether they were atheist or a mixture of things or whether they really believed in. Rohit, I hope that gives you an idea of, um, it speaks to many different projects I'm involved with, uh, especially while thinking about the Rohingya in Burma and, and maybe this idea of the counter monument comes from there. And this idea of how we engage with public space is really uh, moving away from an idea of community, which is not how I used to think. Yash, I'd love for you to perhaps elaborate on um, your research around uh, Indo-Burmese art and also again, politics in that way, collectives that you worked with over time, um, going from, again, the memorable exhibition as part of the Kochi Mazaris Biennale, uh, I See You Just, Burmese Art from 1988, but then also your continued work with artists such as uh, Savang, Wong Zeyangwe, and others. If you could just kind of schematically take us a little bit through where you are at now, uh, briefly, just to share with this audience. And then there is uh, uh, one last uh, question. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I, um, I, you know, when I met some of these artists in 2007, um, what was so important for me was, was maybe the way they used humor to translate um, immense stories of torture and violence, uh, prisons. And uh, uh, I see you just as an anagram for justice. And a lot of the Burmese art follows this kind of word play. They have a lot of visual play because there's something about the language that allows for this kind of play, fullness. And I was really struck by uh, how uh, that what was happening was um, in a few, very few artists who actually knew each other and were con connected to each other, how what was happening was a conversion. And I've used this also to think about curatorial practice. Um, they were taking uh, the structures of the court system, the, you know, and turning it into a performance, a collective performance. And this is happening spontaneously, partly, but also partly it's a, it's a kind of artistic language that was very, very exciting to me to see how we, you know, how, you, how can you flip a court that you know is a fake court and it's a special court and how do you flip that? And uh, the, one of the ways they were doing that was turning it into rituals of congratulating, uh, almost like a graduation ceremony. You're now officially a political prisoner or, um, you know, hugely humorous scenes that would actually throw and convert the courtroom into the farce that it was. And uh, this kind of uh, conversion, I mean, how, how you serving recently looking at the works made in prison. So a lot of the art history of Burma is, you know, especially performance practices is considered to have started in the late nineties, but there was all this work happening within the prison for prison, political prisoner audiences. Uh, and so I've been thinking of the postponed audience, the, you know, us now uh, who still hear the stories and how 
it's almost like an oral object, that performance, because it lives in so many people's memories and we reconstruct it now. So this idea of conversion comes from Adi Ophir. It's an idea that you can't change the system, but you can bribe the warden. You know? And so I've been thinking the, of curating as this kind of crossing of thresholds and lines. Um, and I, I think where I am now is really looking at this idea of illegality. Um, are these works which were unauthorized illegal if the legal system itself is so brutalizing? So, you know, the word illegality cannot happen unless the legal system itself is brutalizing in the way that genocide cannot uh, happen unless the, our ideas of sovereignty itself are so brutalizing. So this, this kind of inversion um, is what I, what I, where I am now with Burma and Myanmar. Thank you, Dasha. Um, we are out of time. There is a question for you, but we're going to take it up in the final discussion, um, which is around um, engagement with the city through the Biennale model, remnants, ruin, debris from installations that stay after the event, so-called. And it would be actually great to take that up with other curators as well. So I'm going to come back to this one. Uh, thank you so much and uh, stay with us. We'll now move on to Gitanjali Dhani.